welcome you to the New York Genome Center. I'm Cheryl Moore, the President and Chief Operating Officer here. Um, I want to give an, a special welcome to our um, the, the representatives of our institutional founding members. The Genome Center was founded um, by those institutional founding members, and we're proud to host you here today. We also have a lot of other friends and colleagues that are joining us. If you're not familiar with the Genome Center, we will be offering tours um, during the lunch break and at the end of the meeting. So please join us and get to know your Genome Center. This is our auditorium, but the rest of the Genome Center is on the other floors. Okay, so we hope you'll join us on a tour. I want to thank the organizers for conceiving of this citywide meeting. This is the fifth meeting of human genetics in New York City, and we're fortunate to host it here. I want to thank the representatives of the New York Genome Center who organized it um, and brought together uh, these incredible speakers. We have a great lineup that I think you're really going to enjoy. So thanks for being here. We're really happy to host you. Uh, looking forward to a great day. I'll now turn it over to Tom Maniatis, our scientific director and CEO. Uh, it's an honor to be able to uh, host this meeting. Uh, I'd like to thank Bruce Gelb, David Goldstein, and Jean Laurent uh, Casanova for uh, bringing this to us and for organizing this incredible uh, effort here. I think this has had a major impact on genetics in New York, and, and uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful initiative. I'd like to thank uh, the uh, New York Genome Center faculty for organizing this meeting. I think uh, they have uh, put together uh, an outstanding uh, agenda, series of talks, uh, and, uh, and poster sessions. So uh, this has been an effort that was really driven by them, and I'd like to thank them for, uh, for their efforts. So without further ado, I'd like to ask John Laurent to uh, speak on behalf of the uh, organizers of the, of the uh, initiative. Thank you, Tom. Yes, on behalf of Bruce Gelb and David Goldstein, I want to thank uh, warmly Cheryl, Tom, and their colleagues for hosting this meeting, the fifth of the series. I also would like to um, solicit a volunteer for the sixth edition. Uh, the first uh, meeting was held at Rockefeller, the second at Columbia, the third at Mount Sinai, the fourth was co-hosted by Cornell and MSKCC, the fifth is here. We already know where the seventh will be held. Aravinda Chakravarti will hold the seventh meeting at NYU in January or February of 2019, but we need one or two institutions uh, that can organize the meeting jointly in September of this year. Don't be afraid of the logistics because Bruce, David, and I, we can help. Uh, we can even provide some funds. Um, so basically, the institution that would host the meeting in September needs to have an auditorium and some goodwill you know, with colleagues to organize the meeting. So we'll be here during the day. And uh, my hope, our hope, is that by the end of the day, uh, we have a, a volunteer for September. Thank you for your attention. So it's my uh, pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Evan Eichler, uh, the keynote speaker uh, for today's uh, symposium. Uh, Evan is professor of uh, genome sciences at the University of Washington uh, in Seattle uh, and an HHMI investigator. Uh, he received his uh, PhD in molecular genetics from Baylor, uh, carried out uh, postdoctoral studies at uh, the Lawrence Livermore Laboratory at Berkeley, uh, and then uh, after a uh, faculty position at Case Western, uh, joined the faculty at the University of Washington. Uh, he's a member of the National Academy of Science, the National Academy of Medicine. Uh, he's been an international leader in studying structural variations as they pertain to both evolution uh, and genetic diseases. He's been an absolute pillar uh, for the Genome Center. He's played a major role in our NHGRI Center grant where uh, he comes to the Genome Center often and is a close collaborator and supporter of the Genome, uh, of the genome Center. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to ask uh, Evan to, uh, to come to the podium. Thanks, Tom. Uh, thanks to the organizers for the opportunity to be here today. 
and to really share with you data, and I'm going to take a maybe a little bit of liberty and give you kind of what I think is a, a 10, 15 year perspective in terms of how, in my mind, the really the genetics of autism have become clearer as a result of advances in genome technology. So just a few words about autism. Uh, most people recognize it now as a neurodevelopmental disorder, and even though definitions have somewhat changed over time, still characterized by this triad of impairments, so delayed speech, repetitive behavior, and uh, impaired social interactions. CDC estimates that it's one every 68 births, so we now recognize it as extremely common, at least in the, in the pediatric field. And it's important to also recognize that the definition, or at least the term autism, is really an umbrella term, which has gotten bigger over time to be more inclusive, with more awareness, more diagnostics, and significant comorbidity with other diseases, in particular epilepsy, intellectual disability, as well as uh, neuropsychiatric conditions. The genetics of autism are also uh, very clear. Um, the latest estimates now suggest that as much as 80% of autism etiology is genetically based. So this is up from where it was a few, a couple years ago in terms of 50%. And the data, I think, is intuitive. It comes largely from family studies as well as identical twins, which have suggested if one monozygotic twin is identified, there's a 90% chance that the other monozygotic twin will or has autism. Uh, the risk in the general population is 1%. Uh, relative risk for SIBs is somewhere between uh, 5 to 20%. So there's clearly a very strong genetic component. The other feature of this disease that is that is always, I found, absolutely fascinating is the male bias. And this is not specific to autism. Many neuropsychiatric, uh, as well as developmental, neurodevelopmental disorders have this male bias. But what I find really interesting is the fact that as the diagnosis of autism becomes more high-functioning, such as the old classification of, of Asperger's, which is now called high-functioning autism, the male bias becomes more pronounced. So I've seen reports as high as eight to one in favor of males over fe uh, females with respect to uh, high-functioning autism. When I really got interested in this field was probably you know in the, in the early 2000s after I left Fragile X Syndrome, and was really kind of frustrated, like many people were, by large-scale studies such as genome-wide association studies that failed to really identify any common risk factors. And people now argue that's due to the fact that they were underpowered. Um, we knew at that time that rare inherited forms of autism, so specific genes that were mutated, would account for about 8 to 10 percent. But if you had 90 percent genetic risk, that means we really were missing most of the genetic basis of autism. So. Where's the rest? Now, I'm going to argue that there have been really three major developments in genomic technologies that have pushed this forward. And the first uh, goes back uh, to the time of what I've kind of put it roughly around 2005, which was the development of microarray technology to begin to look for large-scale copy number changes, so large-scale deletions and duplications. Now, work from our lab, that of Mike Wigglers, and from groups in Europe, uh, early on recognized that, in fact, uh, children with autism and more broadly children with neurodevelopmental disorders actually had a significant excess of large-scale deletions and duplications uh, that were often de novo. That is to say they were sporadic, they're not necessarily inherited, but in some of the initial reports there were three times the number of these large-scale deletions and duplications in the genomes of children with autism and development delay compared to their unaffected siblings. Our own perspective on this was, I came fresh out of the Human Genome Project around 2002. We had built a duplication map of the human genome and identified, and indicated here in gold, areas that we called hotspots for copy number variation. And that was because they had the architecture, the evolutionary architecture, to predispose to recurrent, recurrently microdelete micro and microduplicate. And so we did a fairly small-scale study going after unexplained children with developmental delay and autism spectrum disorder to see if these regions, these gold regions, were predisposed to recurrently delete and duplicate in cases with autism developmental delay compared to controls. I'm not going to bore you with the details, but over a period of about six or seven years in our lab alone, we identified about a dozen new recurrent microdeletions and microduplications associated with uh, uh, deletions and copy number variants. As an example, this is a recurrent microdeletion uh, 
associated with a type of developmental delay now called Coulin de Vries. It's a recurrent deletion that maps uh, to chromosome 17 and deletes about 500 kilobases of sequence recurrently. Uh, these kids, as you can see them, they actually have characteristic facial features. So this bulbous nose, pronounced philtrum. Um, this is now recognized as a syndrome. It's called the Coulin de Vries syndrome. But I think the important point is that this was discovered by genomics first. So we found the recurrent deletion. We showed that they were sporadic, not present in the general population. Then we gathered the patients and worked out the phenotype. Here's another example from our lab from Andy Sharp when he worked with me. Uh, this is a, actually a rare form of autism. All, all children that are shown here are autistic. But when you, this is a deletion mapping to chromosome 15. It's about uh, three megabases in size. Uh, characteristic facial features of these kids, once again, frontal bossy of the forehead. You can see this almond-shaped eyes. All events are de novo, so that means they have, this has occurred in the germline of one of the parents. This piece of DNA is lost. So they have one normal copy of chromosome 15 and are missing about three megabases of sequence that is sporadically deleted. This is about 0.1% or less of all autistic cases, but every family of which there are now 50 that have this deletion have a child with autism. Here's another example. This one is less clear. There's no characteristic, characteristic facial features. It was one that we reported in 2008. It's a recurrent deletion of about 1.5 megabases, mapping distal to the Prader-Willi syndrome region on chromosome 15. Uh, we picked up these kids initially in a screen of kids with moderate intellectual disability. Later, this particular deletion was shown segregating by Tony Monaco in a three-generation family with autism. Later, major efforts from both DECODE as well as on the East Coast showed that this particular deletion was one of the most significant risk factors for schizophrenia. And later, we showed working with a group in, uh, that worked on epilepsy that deletions of this region are associated with 1% of idiopathic generalized epilepsy, making it one of the most significant genetic causes of epilepsy. What's interesting is the same deletion is associated in this case with four different, very different genetic disorders. In fact, I always joke that this particular deletion does not respect NIH or its institutes, because clearly it can actually is associated with a variety of disease, but a high impact risk factor. So very variable expressive. So uh, by Sir, around 2010, 2011, uh, combining all the data, there were about 40 recurrent microdeletions and microduplication syndromes or CNVs that were now proven to be pathogenic. And if you just look at children with developmental disability broadly, and you just ask the question, let's look at their, their pattern of CNVs. This is like a Kaplan-Meier curve, but showing you the proportion of cases in red with the kids with developmental delay compared to people in this room, which would be controls, that have a CNV of a given size or greater. And so what's really interesting and obvious is that there's a huge burden of CNVs in kids with developmental disability. If you pick a number like 500 kilobases, you can see that 25% of the kids that would come into a clinic have a large deletion or duplication compared to people in this room, which is about 10% of you would have such an event. And obviously the bigger event gets, the more pathogenic it is, and the differential becomes greater and greater. So we and others have used this to estimate that about 14 to 15 percent of developmental delay are, are caused by large CNVs, either deletions or duplications. And in the case of autism, if you just have a strict definition, which is ADOS, ADIR criteria, it's about 7 to 8 percent. So work from Stefan Sanders showed that beautifully a few years ago. One other point I want to make before I leave the CNVs is that the other thing you can do is you can ask the question, what proportion of these large CMVs that you ascertain from kids with developmental delay are inherited versus de novo? And here I'm breaking out deletions versus duplications. For about 2,500 families where we identified a large CMV in a child with developmental disability. And what you can clearly see here, just looking at this kind of uh, curve, is that deletions are very different than duplications. So you see, as you might expect, deletions are more deleterious, so a greater fraction of them are in fact de novo, as in can indicated by gray. But if you have a keen eye, and you can integrate under the area, you'll also notice something different about events that are inherited. There's a bias. Females are more likely to transmit. In this case, 60% of the events, when they're transmitted, are coming from females versus 40% coming from a father. And then for autism, this number actually rises to close to 
So when CNVs are being transmitted, mothers are more likely to be carriers, and we believe sons are more likely to manifest the phenotype. So I'll come back to this point, but this I think is relevant to the male bias with respect to these diseases. All right, so I would argue, and I think others would as well, that the whole, that CNVs and the study of large copy number variants, at least with respect to uh, autism and more broadly neurodevelopment, neuropsych disorders, was important because it helped establish a model for thinking about the genetic architecture of these diseases. That sporadic haploinsufficiency is a particularly important mechanism to actually create essentially these conditions in the human species. Each of these individual CNVs is rare, less than 0.1% of all cases, but collectively common. So in the case of development disability, 14 to 15% of cases. Case of autism, strictly defined, 7 to 8%. So this is a big chunk of the human population where this is the, probably the primary cause of the disease. The other important feature is that this observation that mothers, when, they're, when, they're, when these events are transmitted as opposed to being sporadic, are more likely to be carriers. So the CNVs were great because I think they helped establish kind of the model for the disease, but they had a disadvantage is that most of the ones that were identified as pathogenic were quite large and typically involved a half a dozen to a dozen genes. So that brings us to innovation number two, which was exome sequencing. Um, that started to hit the ground around 2008, 2009, with some early papers from Jay Shinduri's lab, I would argue. Uh, and later, we started to implement it around 2010 in terms of actually going back to those patients, those families, where we hadn't found a large CNV. And so here, the model is exactly the same. Instead of actually looking for a CNV, we're looking for a point mutation that's de novo that breaks a gene, so a gene disruptive event. And we had the great fortune of working with the Simon Simplex collection. Many of you know this collection for autism. This is a beautiful collection of about 2,500 families which are deeply uh, ascertained in terms of phenotype, and which over 2,000 or almost 2,000 of the families are in the structure of a quad where there's at least one affected, one unaffected, and then a, a mother and a father. So you can really ascertain the difference in patterns of mutation in both individuals, in terms, especially with respect to de novo mutations. So we started in 2011 to first publish some of the first observations. There was a whole string of papers that some of you will remember, some that came from Mike Wiggler's group, some from Matt States, and there were other studies on other cohorts from Mark Daly. And I would argue that the kind of summation of all this really came with Ivan or Ivan's Iosifov's paper in 2014, which was done jointly with uh, Brian O'Rourke from my lab and Stefan Sanders, where we looked at all really 10,000 exomes from these roughly 2,500 families. So what did we determine from this? Well, this was, for me, particularly exciting. Um, if you compare the rate of gene-disruptive mutations, here defined as likely gene-disruptive, or you, you can break out in terms of nonsense versus splice site, and you compared an affected individual with autism versus an unaffected sibling from the same family, there was about a two-fold excess of likely gene-disruptive, also known as loss-of-function mutations, in probands versus unaffected sibling. This was not a consequence of increased mutation rate, because if you look at synonymous mutation, there is no difference between probands and affecteds. And there is a modest and now very much reproduced signal of a slight excess of missense, de novo missense mutations in probands versus unaffected. So this was important for really two reasons. Number one, it says that there's an extremely strong signal, and that is actually de novo gene disruptive mutations in children with autism. And in terms of the proportion, back of the envelope calculations based on this differential would suggest that about 42% of the de novo loss of function and close to 12% of the de novo missense mutations are contributing to disease. And that would estimate about 21% of the patients, so 7 to 8% from large CNVs for autism, and now 21% coming from essentially these de novo mutations that are largely SNPs in protein coding sequences. There was bad news, and the bad news is when all these 2,500 individuals were, or 2,500 families were characterized, we almost never saw the same gene hit twice. So we knew we were getting a strong signal in the aggregate, but we were having a heart, we were not having the power to call many individual genes. 
And so this suggested that there was extreme locus heterogeneity for autism where 400 to 800 genes, each individually mutated in a different family, could give you the same state, uh, essentially, which is autism. Good news is that the types of genes that were being hit were not randomly distributed in terms of the proteome. So this is a protein-protein interaction network showing you the de novo loss of function mutations in red and, and de novo missense mutations and the, the actual proteins and how they interact with each other uh, based on protein-protein interaction data. So every line here indicates a protein-protein interaction. From our analysis, we concluded that essentially the majority of the genes, about 67% of the genes, were part of one of three networks. Genes associated with a synaptic function, these tend to be expressed later, postnatally, during development. And then two very large sets of genes associated with cell proliferation, what we call loosely a Wnt signaling pathway. And then essentially a set of genes associated with chromatin remodeling. You can see here by the size of the circle that some genes are hit more often than others. So what particularly caught our attention early on was CHD8. This is a gene that we knew very little about, uh, I would say in 2012 when we first started to see hits in it. Uh, but once we identified it from the exomes, we could then go back and target that gene for resequencing in tens of thousands of individuals and see if we could have recover more individuals and do a real kind of appropriate case control design. I won't bore you with the details, this has already been published, but we actually screened on the order of initially about 10,000, now we have close to 20,000 patients, have close to 26 families with uh, loss of function mutations in this gene, and we I think we've seen now one out of, on the order of like 15,000 controls. So clearly, we got a gene that's highly penetrant when mutated, resulting in autism. In this study, when we went back and looked at the inheritance, 11 out of 12 of those initial discovery events were actually de novo. The chances that that would happen by, by chance is uh, close to zero. So the frequency of de novo mutations was really high, just like the CNVs. And in the diagnostic information, so once you identify the gene and you now have double digits in terms of the number of families, you bring those families back into the clinic, just like we did with the CNVs, and we actually ascertain their phenotype. And we noticed, obviously, they have autism. But interestingly, other features appeared, such as macrocephaly. So uh, head circumferences, two standard deviations beyond the mean, 80% of the kids. 73% of the kids had severe gastrointestinal dysfunction, characterized by this really odd pattern of really weeks with diarrhea, followed by weeks of constipation that would go on till about the age of 10. And then at puberty, it would somehow ameliorate. So this is something that we saw in pretty much every family that came in to the clinic. At, at, at in Washington. And so we did experiments like geneticists do, modeling it in zebrafish, and we could recapitulate this overgrowth of the brain. We could actually use markers to show this was due to an expansion of the number of progenitor neurons, both in the midbrain and the forebrain. And the really cool thing is we could also model this defect in terms of the gut. So we could show that when you actually knocked out the gene either by morphins or by CRISPR-Cas, that these zebrafish had a problem with digestion. It took them longer to passage. Uh, and when we actually stained for enteric neurons, which is shown here, uh, we actually saw a reduction in the number of enteric neurons, which we thought was kind of interesting, right? So one gene when knocked out, over proliferation of neurons in the brain, under proliferation of neurons in the actual gut. We've repeated this now for about a dozen of the different genes that we identified from that initial uh, screen. So this is another gene, DERK1A, so dual tyrosine phosphatase kinase. Uh, there are the stats. It's always great when you really don't need the statistics. Common sense just tells you that this is a highly penetrant mutation when you see it, 24 truncating mutations versus two out of double the number of controls. Inheritance, almost all events are once again, again de novo. What's interesting about this one, instead of it being macrocephaly, these kids have microcephaly. So 100% have microcephaly, 100% have intellectual disability. 90% of these kids also have late onset epilepsy. So there's obviously a link with this gene and epilepsy, just like we saw with the CNVs. Uh, and 83% have severe impaired expression language. The clinicians are now convinced that there's characteristic facial features also associated with this particular loss of function mutation. And we don't have to make a model because the mouse model for this has been made because this gene has been implicated in Down syndrome and maps to chromosome 21. And it's thought that dosage increase of this is actually one of the major genes responsible for the cognitive dysfunction in Downs. Loss seems to be associated with autism, epilepsy, 
and development of this ability. In the mouse, you knock it down, and even in the heterozygous, you have a reduced brain. So brain volume is now uh, significantly smaller, which we think helps explain the microcephaly we see in the kids. So this, I think, is important because we call this a genotype-first approach, where it's kind of the opposite of what we were taught to do in genetics, which is work detailed on a phenotype first and then work on the genetics. Here we do a large-scale screen to find the genes, then we actually prove that they're significant, and then we go back to the clinic and bring those patients in as a group and assess whether the phenotype, whether they're more sim similar to one another than would be expected based on what we know about quote-unquote generic autism. So we've been doing this, and I'll just share with you some uh, recent data. We've been analyzing. Uh, we have a, pr a program to screen about 250 genes. We're just about done on close to 16,000 families. This is data from 12,000 of those families. And this is the observed um, significance indicated for loss of function in red and missense in blue for excess de novo loss of function and missense mutations. Here are the genes. Uh, we now have really about 150 genes that, that meet genome-wide significance by this analysis. And this is just walking through this um, minus log base 10 plot, showing you the genes and decreasing significance in terms of the genes that we think are relevant to autism. We think this work is particularly important because aggregate statistics do nothing to, for families. They want to know whether this gene, when hit, is likely responsible for autism for their kid. And this is the type of work that gets you there. So people have argued you could do this with exomes. This is actually a hell of a lot cheaper. We can do about 50 genes for about $12 by targeted resequencing. So we're using a, a technology developed by Jay Shanduri called MIPS, molecular inversion probes, to really target the specific exons and go deeply into these genes. And you'd recognize many of the usual suspects. One of the things I will point out is that most of our hits thus far are de novo loss of function mutations. We have genes for, that are showing excess of de novo missense, but you can see that this curve here is going to take, we think, many more samples to get this, these numbers up in terms of missense mutations. This is another analysis that we've done. This is actually a different approach slightly. Instead of actually doing targeted, we just actually combine data from all published exomes, both from autism and neurodevelopmental disability, because we know there's considerable comorbidity. We applied actually in this analysis two de novo models. We applied our own model, which we call a CHIMP human divergence model for excess de novos. And then this model developed by Caitlin Somoka when she was at Mark Daly's lab based on context to see which genes are being hit. So we basically take all de novo mutations from a database that has been developed by Tichelle Turner, which has meticulously and methodically gone through every paper and painstakingly, and I emphasize that, I hope I have enough, gone through to make sure there's no redundancies in that data. So this is all available for anybody to access. Uh, and then we basically have run these de novo models comparing uh, both, both the Samoka model versus ours. And as you can see, most of the genes are being hit by both models. So I feel pretty confident that we are identifying the genes. At a false discovery rate of 0.1 or 10%, we get about 301 genes in the, on the union and 164 genes on the intersect. What I think is particularly interesting about these is that 76% of the genes that we have identified as being significant are actually seen in both cases of developmental delay and cases of diagnosed autism as the primary diagnosis as being de novo disrupted. So this idea that these are completely two distinct entities is, of, co of course, completely false. And there's great value in actually combining data from pediatric developmental disability studies with essentially autism. When we take these 301 genes and ask what proportion of cases can do have a de novo mutation, it's 10.3% of autism and about 27% of DD cases. So we think these are really high impact genes. Um, and we think this list will grow as we get more and more, more data. How much will it grow? Uh, we tried to do some modeling on this. And I think this is useful for those who are, are interested in doing ec more exomes. Uh, we tried to actually subsample and predict the curve based on different classes of mutations. So this is the red line is the curve that we predict for de novo loss of function mutations, kind of plateauing at about 215 genes. Uh, this is severe missense, so CAD score is greater than 30. It plateaus out at about 100 genes. But then there's this curve, which we think is most interesting, which is de novo missense which are not constrained by severity, but they should just recurrent de novo. We cannot predict this curve yet. 
so our data suggests this is where most of the bang for the buck is going to be with exomes. Is going to, this, we're going to cl clearly identify these 200, and we, we probably already have the ones that are associated with loss of function, uh, but this uh, recurrent missense will be the way to go. One property that we have begun to see with the recurrent missense is not just asking a question of how many times is the gene hit, which is what a lot of these models do, but asking a question of where do these de novo missense actually occur in the protein predicted model. And it turns out there's some, there's some real signal here. Um, this is a paper that we just published in the summer where we've, we applied this one of, there's several methods you could apply, but we just looked for clustering of the de novo missense. So we took all genes that had two or more de novo missense mutations, and we asked, is there any evidence for clustering? And if so, which genes are showing them? And so I'm showing you here some potassium channel genes, as well as this very famous gene that produces the protein CTCF. Some of you may have heard of it. And what I want you to get from it is the pattern of de novo missense mutation is indicated for the cases by the bottom line that says NDD. And so we identify when we do this analysis on all genes that have two or more de novo missense mutation, about 200 genes which are nominally significant that show clustering of de novo missense mutations. And so, for example, this potassium channel, particularly this transmembrane domain right adjacent to it is this little cluster. And if you look above it, it's showing private variants in 1,000 genome or exact. And you can see there's a paucity of mutations in the general population over this little region. Here's another region, a potassium channel. You can see this right around the voltage sensor region. Uh, uh, there's, in fact, this clustering of de novo missense mutations. And there is a, there's a pretty good paucity, at least in exact, and this is based on around 45,000 patients, or individuals, I should say, of actual de novo or actually missense mutations, period, in that region. And then this one, I think, was really cool. This is CTCF. This is, for many of you know, is the protein responsible for binding to insulator elements. And then you see these little clusters of de novo missense. And if you have a triangle, that means the same mutation was seen independently in a different family. So it's, these little triangles indicate recurrent site mutations. And here you see this clustering over zinc finger four and zinc finger seven. And the last time I checked the literature, that is the sites of DNA binding for essentially CTCF. So this is, I think, is incredibly powerful. We have 200 genes that actually show evidence of clustering. And interestingly, the majority of them do not show evidence of excess loss of function mutations. So I think we're defining some of that blue line, kind of the genes that are actually going to be the new genes that are associated with autism and developmental delay. And it's just an example, which I, well, at least the neuroscientist really loved when we showed him this. This is an example where we identified in the database two recurrent sites. So two different families with the same alanine to threonine change at position 636 in this glutamate receptor known as GRIA1. We screened another 10,000 patients using MIPS and identified another three patients and nothing in controls. We tested five of these and three of them where we could actually get parental information all were de novo. That's what the little uh, lightning bolt indicates here. This region that's affected is not actually in the transmembrane domain, but it's a highly conserved roughly 15 amino acid region that is not only conserved between species all the way down to Drosophila, but is conserved between other glutamate receptors. So shown here are other glutamate receptors. All individuals that we typed had a autism and a, and a kind of specific learning disability associated with it. But what was really cool is that this very mutation, this alanine to threonine at position 636 has been seen before, but in a different glutamate receptor called GRID2. And there it results in the Lurcher phenotype in mice and a dominant cerebellar ataxia that transmits dominantly within families in humans. So what's different about GRID2 and GRIA1? GRID2 is expressed specifically in the cerebellum. GRIA is expressed broadly in the developing brain. So did patch clamp assays with Larry Zweifel at the, Neuro, at the Department of Neuroscience and show that this particular mutation, maybe not unexpectedly, acts similarly in a dominant negative fashion when you now uh, test it in these patch clamp assays. So I think missense, clustered missense are the way forward, and that's where people should be looking, I think, in, with, with exome data. Last point I'll mention with the exomes is everything I talked about was de novo missense or de novo mutations, period. What about inherited mutations? 
And so I had a, a MSDP or MD PhD student named Nick Crum who decided to look at inherited mutations because you have 2,500 families. Maybe there's some inherited signal in these simplex families. So he partitioned the mutations that were inherited based on allele frequency going all the way from 1% down to private. Now, private means they're seen only in that family and nowhere else, so they're evolutionary quite young. And he partitioned whether they were in red loss of function or missense mutations. And then he did a very simple experiment. Let's calculate the odds ratio between the affected and unaffected, because we have that data from the Simon simplex. So when he did that, no, he saw nothing for missense or loss of function at 1%. He saw nothing at 0.1%. But when he looked at private variants, he saw this odds ratio change, roughly 1.15, where there's a transmission disequilibrium, i.e. probands were more likely to have private loss of function mutations than their unaffected SIB. If we took David Goldstein's RVIS or ARVIS score and just further partition whether a gene was tolerant to mutation or not, you see that this odds ratio increases as you get to genes, particularly in the bottom 20th percentile, that are intolerant to mutation. And the really cool thing is if you ask the question now, does it matter from which parent this came? The answer is almost all the signal comes from mothers to their sons. So mothers, just like the CNVs, are carrying these private loss of function mutations and is a transmission preferentially to the affected because of obviously disease being the driver here. At least that's the way we interpret it. So we think this is actually giving us some insights in terms of that maternal, or I should say a, a male bias with respect to the disease. So we can integrate all this data on the Simons set of samples we know there's a significant excess of large CNVs, when transmitted, that comes from moms, excess of de novo gene disruptive SNVs and indels, and an excess of private truncating mutations. And when those are transmitted, those are coming from mothers to their sons. Chapter three, the next advance in terms of genome technologies, whole genome sequencing. And I can't believe we're still debating this in 2018, but the reason to do genomes over exomes is simple more comprehensive assessment of genetic variation, end of point. The cost differential is, become, is becoming less and less of an issue, and there are faster and better ways to do, do targeted sequencing than exomes, in my opinion. So we did a pilot study of the same families, targeting back in 2016, uh, 40 quad families, whole genome shotgun sequencing uh, from the Simons collection. And we were encouraged, because when we looked at the data, of course you have no power with 40 families, what we found is we thought we identified 16 families that in fact had structural variants or de novo mutations, five of which had not been previously seen by exome. And so here's an example of some of those families. This is an inherited mutation of a gene that's known to be really important uh, in terms of autism. It may, it's in our top 50 list, DSCAM. And you have this beautiful deletion that's completely not intersecting an exon is all these DNA's hypersensitivity sites overlapping it and it's transmitted from mother to son. Here's another gene that is statistically significant for de novo mutations and we have a inherited duplication that intersects an H3K27 acetylation signal and being transmitted from mother to son. And so this is all opaque, right, by exome sequence. You could not detect these events and we think we've actually identified potentially pathogenic events for these families. So working with the New York Genome Center um, and with competitors and collaborators all uh, kind of working together and against each other on these, we targeted 516 families and we went for the, the toughest of autism families. Those that were negative for large CNVs and they were negative for a loss of function or putative likely gene disruptive mutation that was de novo. So these were the negative families from the Simon Simplex collection. Sequence 2000, or I should say New York, sequence 2000 of these families at 30-fold sequence coverage is probably some of the best sequence that I've ever seen. And I can say that because I've looked at pretty much every, ge every genome center's productivity and, and quality over the last 20 years. And then we simply, the idea was straightforward. Let's compare the pattern of de novo mutations between probands and unaffected. It's the usual thing that we would do with this particular collection. I won't bore you with this. This is brutal. Um, largely the work of Tichelle Turner in my group to come up with a plan that would involve calling five different CNV callers as well as two different SNP callers to actually focus on de novo variants 
and actually a hybrid plan that involved using both cloud computing in blue, borrowing some of the computational strength of NYGC, but then the stuff in green is the work that we did, kind of the, the, the meta-analysis and the post-analysis on our side. So this is the data. So we identified 127,000 de novo variants, and I'm just depicting both proband and sibling uh, events here so you can see them. There is essentially no difference uh, between probands and siblings. Um, you can see that the pattern is virtually identical for these 127,000 in terms of the distribution. We went ahead and validated about 2,000 events. So the validation rate for unique sequence is about 97.0%. And for repetitive regions, it's about 84%. So that meant on average there were 88 de novo SNPs. We estimated that were valid and f roughly five indels. We think this is an underestimate. It should be a little bit higher than this. But this is the highest new mutation rate that's been reported thus far, 1.5 times 10 to the minus 8. Most people report around 1.3. Uh, we think it's because the quality of the data are actually just that much better. So we're having better access to repetitive regions. Not complete yet, but better than we've had before. What did we learn? Well, this is probably a no-brainer. Increased sensitivity to detection of, st of structural variants versus genomes. And this is looking just at CNVs that are de novo that are intersecting exonic regions. So you can detect CNVs from exome data, but they tend to be larger, and you can actually detect much smaller events down to two kilobases, so about three and a half times smaller than what you can detect from exome, and you essentially more than double the number of such de novo exonic events. And why is that relevant? Well, if you then compare probands versus unaffected siblings, we see actually a clear signal, an excess of de novo, smaller CNVs disrupting genes. Now remember, these individuals were picked because they were negative for CNVs, but they were negative for the large CNVs, which I discussed in, like the, in the very beginning. Right? So these are smaller CNVs that we didn't know anything about, but we picked them up from, exome, or from genomes. They would not have been picked up from exomes. This one might be a surprise, but maybe isn't uh, to some people. If we just focus on coding sequence, we have increased sensitivity for detection of de novo variants in the actual protein coding. So if you don't give a damn about the rest of the genome and all you care about is protein coding, do a genome because you're going to pick up about 2.5% to 5% more de novo variants in those regions. And so this is, this is the data. We found 12 de novo loss of function mutations. Now remember, these have been screened previously not to carry de novo loss of function. So we picked them up that exome had missed. And we think about half of them are actually pathogenic. And so here are validated examples like ARID1B, CATNAP3, and FIP, where these are de novo loss of functions that we picked up from genome that we didn't pick up from exome. These families weren't screened for a missense before we went in, so we had the missense information, but if you just compare the number of severe deleterious missense between probands and siblings, there's a significant excess of deleterious missense mutations in the probands versus the unaffected siblings. So to summarize what we found, this is comparing probands in red versus unaffected siblings in blue. Significant excess of severe missense, significant excess of de novo deletions that disrupt genes. Okay. What about the non-coding regions? So what we decided, instead of comparing everything under the sun, under ChIP-seq and uh, DNA's hypersensitivity sites and every possible annotation, we decided to keep it pretty tight. We're going to focus just on UTRs of genes, which are pretty well defined. We're going to focus on promoters, and we're going to define enhancers very lim in a very limited way. DNA's hypersensitivity sites that are found in fetal brain, because we know that a lot of the genes are expressed in the fetal brain, and which underneath it is a, tra a conserved transcription factor binding site. So we looked just at the transcription factor binding site. So these were the results. There was a nominal significance for excess de novo mutations in UTRs, and the signal was coming largely from 3' UTRs. There was an increase, but it wasn't significant for these transcription factor binding sites. If we restricted it to ones where there was functional evidence of a fetal promoter or an embryonic cancer, we had nominal significance. So we got excited, although some of our competitors said they don't believe the signal that was there. We got even more excited if we said, let's restrict it now to those genes that have already been implicated in autism. So we took two sets, one from the Safari, 845 genes, and one from turning 57. So these are our genes that we identified that showed de novo significance. And here we actually had significance. 
So taking all variants of de novo that we think are functional, we have a significant excess. And this is just a waterfall plot to show you the various classes of de novo mutations in probands compared to the unaffected siblings. You can see an overall about twofold excess where the, the UTRs are in yellow, putative non-coding regulatory sequences in green, and some genes, really good genes, like norexin-1, being hit multiple times, for example, in probands. So there's four probands that have hits in those types of genes. Last point. We decided to do one more analysis. I said we said we have de novo missense, we have uh, essentially putative non-coding regulatory and UTRs. Let's actually count the number of events per patient and compare it to the number of events we're seeing in unaffected sibling. So these would be, for example, a comparison of probands versus siblings for individuals that had no variants of interest that were de novo, one, two. These would be individuals with three or more de novo variants in these types of sequences. And the really interesting observation is you can see that probands are actually underrepresented for zero, one, and two. But when we get to three, which means three or more de novo variants, they take over. So you actually see this effect where it's 61, 23 to 11, 8 to 5, where there's an excess of multiple de novo variants in putative functional elements in probands versus the unaffected sibling. So one can argue what the phenotypic consequence would be of this. Our data suggests that these individuals with multiple events tend to be more severe. But Mike Wiggler did some interesting analysis about a month ago and showed that the only way we could get this is if conditionally roughly 30% of the variants that we're identifying are actually pathogenic. So we think we're hitting it. If we were to do that analysis over again and now we're strict to the genes that have been implicated in autism, we see a significant excess of de novo variants of interest. So this is individuals with two or more events in safari genes or adjacent to safari genes. And interestingly, we have a signal. It's modest, but it's significant just if we restrict to non-coding putative regulatory sequences. That includes UTR enhancers and promoters. So I'm pumped. We obviously need replication of this, uh, but our data would suggest this may account for another 10% of patients, this, or some lower estimates are 5%. We think it'll go up from this. But just to say that we're very interested in replicating this finding, and Tashel Turner has been working hard to do this. She took the next 374 autism quads that came off from the Genome Center that was sequenced here and combined it with data from Missing, which is a, a published study uh, that was published uh, last year on additional trials from a different autism cohort. These are our various categories, so missense, severe missense, UTRs, putative non-coding transcription factor binding sites, differences between probands and unaffected. And on the combined data, so this isn't truly a replication yet, it's combining all the data, you can see we got significance now for putative non-coding transcription factor binding sites, which I'm really pleased with. And we're also seeing evidence for this oligogenic or multiple hits. So these data, I hope, with the next set of 500 or even 1,000 quads will become even uh, more striking. So in conclusion, I think the last 15 years have just rocked for autism genetics. And it's been driven largely by genomic technology. Microarrays set really the the model for thinking about disease, which is the importance of de novo and private variants, and explaining perhaps a much 7 to 8% of autism cases. Exome sequencing provided the specificity to identify the individual genes. It blew our socks off the level of locus heterogeneity, and so that's important because we obviously have to screen many more patients. But the important part is it gave us individual genes. And now, I think the important point is that we're now starting to see other patterns, such as clustered and recurrent missense mutations, particularly in specific portions, defining protein domains as opposed to just the gene itself. This is probably an upper bound, but 21% of the patients by some estimates. Genome sequencing is probably too early to say what fraction of patients uh, are going to be resolved by this. But I think this is, the, this is what's going to proceed to, you know, for the next uh, kind of next decade or so. Its power comes from more comprehensive assessment of genetic variation. I think that's fundamentally the key. Uh, and we're now detecting different classes of variation, such as smaller CNVs. There's an excess in probands versus unaffected siblings, de novo regulatory mutations, and in particular, this model, if it holds, of multiple de novo mutations in probands, because it may be that they need multiple hits to push them to a disease state. 
So it's been great. This is my glass half full slide, right? With respect to what we know about the genetic etiology of autism. I would argue we cannot figure out the rest of this green without genome sequence. And I would argue that we even need better genome sequence than what we're currently producing with short read data. We are missing a large fraction of structural variation that's present in these genomes, even when we sequence a genome at 30x. This is a minor point, but I think it's also a critical point. In addition to technology driving this field, I think the other thing that I've realized is that every individual lab, every individual consortium is currently underpowered to actually prove individual loci. We actually have to actually connect more broadly. We have to connect with the patients. We have to connect with the clinicians. And this is why initiatives such as the SPARC initiative from Simons is so important because it's going to get us to numbers, it's going to get us to patients, and it's going to allow us to begin to work out the phenotype. And then this obviously is the part that I think the tie that binds most of us in this room. If we can actually identify the genetic causes of any disease, whether it's autism or cancer, we'll be able to distinguish the types genetically. Our data suggests that a significant number of these genetic etiologies that are common are going to have more shared phenotypic consequences, which is important. I think that's important to the families, actually, to identify other children, other families that have the same type of issues that their child has. But obviously, the hope then is that by identifying these genetic types, we'll group them into specific networks and we'll develop therapies that will be used to essentially target the networks and the protein interactions and actually, and hopefully, in my lifetime, begin to improve the quality of life of these kids, which I think is why many of us are in this business. So these are all the folks that, well, hopefully I, most of the folks, I shouldn't say all, because there's a lot of work here I covered over, over 15 years. Um, these are the most recent people who allow me to present unpublished data. Maybe I should emphasize that. Uh, particularly to Shell Turner, Brad Coe, two postdocs in my group, Madeline Geishiker, who's an MD-PhD student, uh, fantastic collaboration with the New York Genome Center, and particularly Mike Zodi, um, who's just maintained an, an outstanding quality of genome sequence. And then I also want to acknowledge Rafe Bernier. He's the clinical guy on our side who brings the patients back in, analyzes them, assesses them for phenotypic uh, uh, similarities. And of course, funding has been critical, but more critical have been the patients and families without whose contributions we couldn't do the work that we do. So we're indebted to them uh, being part of this project. Thanks.